All the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. That is from St. Francis of Sicily. There is a candle in your heart ready to be kindled, and that is from Ruby. Um, I don't know if we have any here yet, but before we get started, I just want to say Happy Father's Day to uh, Robert, at least. And Bill. And Bill. Congregation of Atlanta Celebration of Life. My name is Jan Lister, and I will be your facilitator today. And our musician is the fabulous Gene Heiner. And it's time for our opening song. So, what are we doing, Gene? Oh, wait, I'm having difficulty making choices. So, um, I'll put it up to a vote. Do you all want to start on, I'm on my way to the Freedom Land, or ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, or uh, eyes on the prize, or Harriet Tubman? What do you want to start with? I, I love don't let nobody turn me around because it's a lively. What? I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Very good. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. And we will not say any words in the book. We will say ain't gonna let nobody turn me around like we And then the next verse will be, ain't gonna let oppression turn me around. <laughs> and then the next verse will be, ain't gonna let Suppression, like voter suppression, turn me around. And the next verse will be, ain't gonna let depression <laughs> turn me around. Because existentialists have to deal with the exterior world and the interior world as well. Okay, so. Uh,
Just a reminder, we, we require masks if you don't have one or some on the table back there. Um, we are a philosophically based spiritual community dedicated to human liberation and founded on existentialist and feminist principles. By existentialist principles, we mean that we are what we do in the world and we accept responsibility for our choices and our actions. You know, I know we say the same thing every week, but I feel like it's important to repeat this for some reason. It just it feels good. Um, by feminist principles, we mean that we accept and actively support freedom and justice for every person. We support diversity as a source of strength and we actively include everyone. We make our spiritual home in the Old Stone Church, which was hand-built 100 years ago by the African-American Antioch East Baptist Church. We honor the labors of love and the powerful history of this very special place, which was deliberately and maliciously taken away from them. We acknowledge that our spiritual home stands on land forcibly taken from the Muskogee Creek people, and we support justice and equality for all indigenous people. Uh, at this time, I'd like to remind you to please put your devices on silent. Feel free to wander around, um, but please do so quietly and respectfully. Um, our speaker today is Reverend Denise Davis, whose topic is Why We Must Remember Juneteenth. I went online to find some quotes for today's services I always do when I facilitate, and I found some very powerful ones, um, but I didn't find there was a little bit of a problem because they weren't mine. And by that, I mean I never had to experience those things that most of the quotes were about. Um, I guess everybody's faced some kind of discrimination, regardless of who they are. Um, you know, I've been passed over for a couple of promotions, and, I got fired once because I wouldn't have sex with the manager, so you know. <laughs> you know what I'm say. Um, but these were very specific things and very few. Um, I've never been given a major sentence for a minor crime. I've never been discriminated against when trying to buy a house. I've never been followed around the store by someone who thought I was going to steal something. I've never been killed. <laughs> or protested for, or, or beaten for protesting. I've never been stopped by the police for driving white. I never had to sit my child down and tell her the facts of life. Not about sex, but the real facts of life for a black person in America. I've never been yanked out of a car by a cop after being stopped for something minor. I've never had my neck kneeled on. I don't know what any of these things are like. My daughter told me that when she was younger, she didn't get the whole white privilege thing because we were white and we certainly weren't privileged. You know, we didn't live in a giant house and drive fancy cars. We couldn't afford to buy whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted. But when she got older, she had a, oh, wait a second, moment. When she realized that white privilege didn't have anything to do with things, it had everything to do with how we're able to live our lives. I understand the meaning of Juneteenth and what it is and why it's celebrated. I may never be able to really feel what it's all about, but I do know one thing. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, and that includes me. Juneteenth may represent freedom, but that freedom has been and still is limited in so many ways for so many people. And so to paraphrase Frank, if it, it, it limits anyone else, it limits me as well. That's why it's important for me and all white people to participate in Juneteenth celebrations and to learn everything that we can about it and why I'm so looking forward to hearing what Reverend Davis has to tell us today. Here's a quote from Barack Obama. 
Juneteenth has never been a celebration of victory or an acceptance of the way things are. It's a celebration of progress. It's an affirmation that despite the most painful parts of our history, change is possible, and there's still so much work to do. And for my hero, John Lewis, you must never, ever give up. We must keep the faith because we are one people. We are brothers and sisters. We all live in the same house, the American house. Um, so now we'd like to recognize any newcomers that are with us here today, or who haven't been here for a long time, and I'm talking about you, Michael, and Petruchio, and Peter. Um, they came uh, a few, two or three years, I guess, you know, back when we were open a couple of times, but um, it's so wonderful to see you here again today. You want to just stand up and say a little something about yourselves? No? <laughs> see you back here one day. So it's just wonderful to see you. I'm so happy you're here. Welcome. Yeah. As you can see, we've grown a little smaller, but you know, we're getting it back little by little. Uh, so now we'd like to... Oh, I did that. Um, okay.
Okay, it's now time for our silent meditation, which is all well, know is one of my favorite parts of, of uh, the service. I know when I first came here, um, they said we're gonna do five minutes of silence, my mind just went crazy thinking, oh my god, how can I sit with myself for five minutes? Um, but it turned out to be a wonderful experience. I just got to, you know, meditate a little bit and, and think about um, you know, things in my life and uh, you know, I hopefully appreciate it and, and, and just also to just to feel the vibes around me and you know that's just coming from this wonderful place. So um, you may like candles, we have them on either side of the room, or just sit and reflect. Feel free to get up, but um, please be cognizant of your fellow congregation's silent time and I will ding the bell when five minutes are up. Struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. And that's from Coretta Scott King. You can't separate peace from freedom because no one can be at peace unless he has his freedom. It's from Malcolm X. And I, I just wanted to mention something I mentioned earlier that I've never had to sit my da daughter down and tell her the facts of life. And I was talking to her yesterday, and I was telling her about today, the facilitation. And she said, well, you know, Mom, um, I think all white people should sit their, their kids down and tell them about the facts of life and tell them what other people are, are dealing with and how we can help our society with that. And I thought, oh, you know, what a great kid I got. Um, okay, are we doing another congregational song? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is a song that I wrote that was inspired by our senator, Reverend Warnock, and Prince. So uh, it's, it's got a, a repeat and a column response thing I want to teach to. So. Uh, We have more power than we know. 
is the lyric, okay? So this is how it sounds and what you're the journey. We have more power than we know. We have more power than we know. We have more power than we know. We 
Senator Warren, and, and tell him that he was your inspiration. That was wonderful. Okay. I'm but, sorry, I'm serious. That was so great. Okay. Google, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it was a fun song. Um, okay, it's now time for joys, sorrows, and milestones. Uh, this is a time to briefly share those things that have meaning to you. And uh, this is a really important part of the COL because this is a time when you can be heard and supported. Um, and please, do we have a microphone? Amplify black voices. Support black owned businesses. Reach back. Mentor. And that was from Chadwick Boseman. Um, if you don't know who Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman was, he uh, was an actor who played uh, you know, mostly historical roles like Jackie Robinson and uh, Marshall Thurgood. And if you watch the movie Get On Up, you will swear he was James Brown. Um, I think he's best known for his role as Black Panther. Uh, unfortunately, he died young of colon cancer. He was 43. Uh, that was a you know real tragedy for the film industry because he was an up and coming wonderful young actor. <clears throat> Every year we must remind successive generations that this event triggers a series of events that one by one defines the challenges and responsibilities of successive generations. That's why we need this holiday. It's from Al Edwards. And from Joy Reid, who if you watch MSNBC. You know who she is. She does a seven o'clock show. She is wonderful. She's my favorite. Um, the persistence of violent white nationalism, these things that have deep, ugly roots, inextricably tied to slavery and its aftermath. We will be better off on Earth and get in airing it out if we really want to repair. And from the wonderful Shirley Chisholm, in the end, Anti-black, anti-female, and all forms of discrimination are equivalent to the same thing. Anti-humanism. Humanism. Okay, we are a generous and giving congregation. Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. If I could have a couple of people come up. And Anne Frank said, and I just, you know, I love Anne Frank quotes because she was prolific and amazing for a 14-year-old child. Um, no one has ever become poor by giving. You know, and the, the thing I really love about Anne Frank is under the circumstances under which she was living, you know, she still had these beautiful, wonderful thoughts the whole time. She's a graduate of Clark Atlanta University, where she earned a BA in art. She also holds a Master's of Divinity from Vanderbilt University Divinity School and a Master of Science in Rehabilitation Counseling from Georgia State University. And I personally just love it when she speaks. If she just stood up here and read the phone book, I would still be just as enthralled <laughs> by the look of her voice and her tones and just her wonderful way of expressing things. 
So please welcome Reverend Angela Davis. scholarship and folks who are committed to making sure that we all 
understand and appreciate and celebrate this now federal holiday. What is Juneteenth? There is a writer by the name of Donald Norman Cox who wrote a book entitled Juneteenth 101. And in that book he talks about a lot of myths related to this holiday. And one of the greatest myths is the idea that people didn't know. People in Texas, be they the enslavers or the enslaved, did not know about the Emancipation Proclamation and the call to freedom. He says that's one of the greatest myths that's told because actually those enslavers and the powers that be in Texas were well aware of the Emancipation Proclamation. And whether or not the enslaved knew about it was really a moot point because there's nothing they could have done. Because if they would have run off, they would have been run away, enslaved people, and brought back to the plantation where they were forced to work. He says we have to really fully understand what happened and what Juneteenth is. And so he says, I like to tell people Juneteenth, which stands for June 19, 1865, is when the U.S. Army landed on the shores of Galveston, Texas, <clears throat> with their naval ships coming to enforce Emancipation Proclamation to the Texas Confederates, who knew, but were not interested in complying. That's why we must remember Juneteenth. It's not that people don't know about the call to freedom and justice for those who are disenfranchised from it. It's that they're not willing to be a part of ushering forth that divine right which we all have. Let's not be fooled. Getting freedom and justice is a hard one fought, fight. And when, when it is won, we still have to keep fighting on behalf of it. So, Norman Cox says we must understand this myth. And we must also understand that just because the U.S. Army was there and they came to Galveston, it doesn't mean that other parts of Texas people were so quick to comply. It meant that those who celebrated Juneteenth <clears throat> were forced back to work on the same fields they worked on June 18th. That freedom didn't come that day to say that June 19, 1865 marked the end of slavery in this country is really incorrect. Rather, he says it is a beginning. <clears throat> it's the time at which we see that we are walking towards the 14th Amendment, which was ratified in December later that year, 1865. And Georgia was the last state to ratify the 14th Amendment. Tells you a little bit about Georgia. <clears throat> but Georgia wasn't the last state to emancipate the enslaved because actually Kentucky and Delaware didn't even outlaw slavery. So we see that within this story of Juneteenth, there's a lot of myth making and misinformation that needs to be parsed out for us to really understand why we need to remember this because there's such a long. And we can't go into the fallacy of believing that just because one act is done, that we all are free. Sometimes you are at the beginning of your fight and not the end, just when you think you are. Juneteenth is a beginning. And some would say, even after excuse me, the 13th Amendment, that there was still slavery with the institutionalization of the prison industrial complex, which we see now 
is a fight that we are still fighting for freedom and for justice. No, you didn't need to work on a cotton field, but if you had just a, a trivial, trivial crime, let's say you weren't respecting a white person, you could be arrested and taken into jail, and your labor would be used wherever you were imprisoned. So this idea that slavery ended on June 19, 1865, is one we need to clarify. We need to understand in our history making that this is not something we want to be wedded to. He also says, Donald Norman Cox, that in Texas history books you can read where they say the slave owners, the enslavers, willingly, willingly <coughs> usher forth freedom for those who are enslaved. Texas books and textbooks. Textbooks. And I'm not talking about textbooks from 1950. Textbooks, even a few years ago, McGraw-Hill published a textbook in which they talked about immigration. And all the people who came and immigrated to the United States, including those in the Atlantic slave trade, who immigrated here as quote-unquote workers. So I'm concerned about this idea of misinformation we spread in history. We make the assumption that the things our children are taught in these textbooks is true. Oh, but folks want to talk about critical race theory and all the things that children are being taught in school today. But what are they really being taught in school today?
The Wizard of Oz, when they were going to the poppy fields, they were very comfortable. <laughs> and they got all trapped. Because their comfort lulled them to a place of inaction. In our days when we are so needed to be urgent on the side of justice, we cannot no longer be comfortable or desire that place of being lulled to sleep and comfortable. I suggest rather we have to deal with the conflict of history with ourselves and with our children to acquaint ourselves with the difficult aspects of history and white supremacy and how it has shaped all of us <clears throat> in ways where we've been on the losing side of humanity. Oh, my friends, if you would only desire conflict over comfort. Because you, you can't come to a place of coalition <clears throat> till you feel the conflict inside of you which urges you forth to say, I got to be with other people and we have to fight for this, we have to fight for justice, we have to fight for truth, we have to fight for freedom. Oh, there's some conflict inside of me. But I know that I have to be in coalition with someone else and be committed to the cause. If you leave here today, just think about those four C's. Don't be so comfortable that you would prefer that over the conflict, <clears throat> which will then lead you to coalition where you can commit yourselves to justice. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Just those four C's. Can you say that again? You can't become so comfortable that you want that instead of the conflict that brews when we are on the side of justice and fighting for liberty and freedom. Because that conflict then ushers us forward to a place of coalition where we can commit ourselves with other people to fight. We can't get so comfortable that we forget there is an urgent need to move forward. We have normalized mass shootings in this country. Uh, we've normalized it. Now it's like, okay, there's another shooting. <coughs> we've normalized that. Every night when we look on the nightly news, we can see the spiraling down of democracy in this country. Yes. Oh, yeah. We see how voting rights are being shipped away day by day, and at the same time, we have to deal with the complacency of some people who don't even want to vote. Yeah. We are in an urgent need of people who will not be bothered by the conflict inside of them, but they will move forward to do coalition work and be committed to justice and liberty. That's what Juneteenth is about. It's a reminder that we are at the beginning of something. Nothing we can't sit on our laws. There's much work to be done. You have to wrestle with inside of yourself and realize now is my time to make a difference. And I don't care if I'm going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care if my family thinks I'm too much. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care if my friends don't think I'm in fashion yeah. with my need to fight for justice. And I actually just to imagine the idea of 
like this. A little acorn that falls far from a tree to the ground. And that little acorn has a new perspective now. As it looks up at this tall oak tree. And something inside of it says, I got the genetic makeup for this. <laughs> I don't know, but I just feel like I could be something like this. And the oak tree was listening and starts to chuckle. So you want to be like me, little acorn, the tree says. And the acorn says, yeah, I want to be like you. I just want to sit here and moment and contemplate being like you. And the oak tree says to the acorn, well, if you want to be like me, you have to realize that it's going to be difficult. There are going to be some times when you're uncomfortable. <clears throat> there are going to be some times when your shell cracks open. There's going to be a time when you're going to have to then reach down into the earth, root yourself and reach up to the sky, to the sun, and plant yourself towards the stars. And it's not an easy journey, little acorn. It's not going to be very comfortable for you. But what you should know, Acorn, is that as an old tree, I'm pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. I filter out pollutants in the air and provide oxygen for the world. I make a home and food for all sorts of animals and plants. Even when I die, I still keep on giving with my tree trunk for other animals and plants. You see, I, I'm a key species, little acorn. If it were not for me, other things wouldn't exist. And the acorn thought about this. And the journey ahead it wasn't a comfortable one. And the old tree continued and said, now once you've been rooted, planted and reaching high to the sky, it doesn't stop there. Because there are some invasions, invasive plants that will try to drown out the sunlight around you. And there is development all in this forest of people building homes shopping malls and office buildings that may threaten your existence. <clears throat> but little acorn, you have to have a robust hope yeah. and know that you are planted down and you're reaching up and it's going to be difficult at times. But if you're going to make a difference in this life and make some shade for somebody, some food for somebody, some housing for somebody, you've got to be okay with being uncomfortable and being broken and giving down and reaching up. Why do we remember Juneteenth? Because it's that beginning. When we are called to become uncomfortable and get rooted in that which we know to be true. The fight for justice and equality is still here. Unless we're willing to reach down into the dark soil, the rich, warm soil of who we are as humans and the right to be here and then reach up towards the stars and other people. Unless we're willing to do the work that justice requires, we'll miss our opportunity to be the key in this world for justice 
and liberation. Give me justice. You can have all this world. Give me justice. And so it is.
to attend our celebration of life, life next Sunday when our speaker will be Althea Sumter. And her topic is, And Another Black Woman Dies. I think it's I'm going to be about those things that are expected of black women by their families and their communities and the way those expectations affect them. And Libby, aren't you facilitating next week? Charlie. Charlie. Uh, I'd like to thank Jean for her wonderful music as usual. Uh, and I'm going to end with three quotes from Fancy Hanger. Nobody's free until everybody's free. <laughs> Juneteenth may mark just one moment in the struggle for emancipation, but the holiday gives us an occasion to reflect on the profound contributions of enslaved black Americans to the cause of human freedom. It gives us another way to recognize the central place of slavery and its demise in our national story. And it gives us an opportunity to remember that American democracy has more authors than the shrewd lawyers and erudite farmer philosophers of the revolution. That our experiment in liberty owes as much to the men and women who toiled in bondage as it does to anyone else in the nation's history. That's from Jamal Bowie. And finally from Desmond Tutu. My humanity is bound up in yours, for we can only be human together. Thank you, everybody. It's fun today. Hopefully, we'll see you afterwards for the kiddish. And uh, next Saturday, don't forget to be here and uh, next week for the service. So it's been great. Thank you, Reverend Davis, for your wonderful speech.